Um, and this is a section of a series um, entitled Letters to My Miscarriage. These days, all I do is think about her, sinking ships in the bathtub and waiting for her fingers to prune. That's how you know you're clean, when the skin absolves enough suds that your fingers age 50 years. She said that boats were better than ducks, that you couldn't feel bad about torpedoing an empty ship, but who could sink a rubber duck? My child, red hair suits you. I have this reoccurring dream where I, bit, where I wake in the bottom of the starboard bow while water it seeps in under the floor. I look for my petty officer. I look for the others. But the room is flooding quickly. Now, you say I'm a dog barking at nothing, barking at shadows in the night. But there are more than sycamores in the yard. I remember when I held you in my arms, rocking until your eyelids fell like metal-jawed traps slapping shut on a coyote foot. The cold you caught from the Davis boy made it unbearable to lie in the crib by yourself, and so we rode the night out like we were on the Tasman Sea. Before you caught spreading up each deck with water at your ankles, before you hit the top and leaned over the rail to see your crew on shore, Recognize, child. They'll leave you to drown. So uh, we were asked to read one translation from Poetry International and one of our own poems. And I'm not going to read my translation <laughs> from here because that'd be too easy. Um, I'm going to read a poem that was written by Osip Mandelstam. And there's a beautiful portfolio of his work in here, translated by Christian Wyman. And I had a hard time picking just one because they're, they're all very beautiful. Um, this is Maybe Madness. Maybe madness too has meaning here. Maybe conscious, knotted like a cyst, knowing and being known by sun and air. Maybe life unties and we exist. Bring to mind the mindless spider, its care for the pillared invisible, little crystal temple, all air and otherness. As if a form could thank its maker, as if every line of light back to one source were drawn, as if deep in wilderness a raftered hall rose around the risen guests, all pain purged from their faces. As it is on earth, Lord, not in heaven, on earth and in a house whose walls are song. Even the birds, even the littlest, fearless. O oh Lord, to live so long. Forgive me this. Forgive what I am saying. Whisper it, less than a whisper, like someone praying. Uh, so this is a poem that I wrote called Good morning. I've yet to tell you how I love you now. It's new, this blue morning gold finches rob hanging feeders of seeds. The tea seems just hot enough. The weeds outside don't need me. You do. I miss your man musk when you walk to the post office without me. I'm not lying about your hands. They're the peridot-topped crowns of my small castle once guarded with guns. Mammoth as tow trucks, you squash them with just your thumbs. What are you eating for dinner? Can I come with purple carrots to awaken our plates? I'd julian all the earth's roots if you'd have me forever. It wouldn't be enough of this pacing, should I simply deliver this letter to help you remember the time you thrust your hand through the sky and said, trust me, it's yours. I'm so tickled to stitch my fingers with yours are a bit calloused, but I promise to be smooth. I too will not read my own translation because that's just too easy. Um, I will be reading a poem by Lynn Z and it's titled Burning. I look into your eyes, which are filled with water when you kneel down. You hold your hands together before your chest and before me, and you have held both of your hands in front of the chest. I pray to get serenity, 
not earth, from underneath your knees. I pray the fire I've lit will only fall into my own incense burner. You are porcelain, so am I. All hear me okay? And so the poem that I'm going to read that is my own, um, just a little context, I feel it's a little needed. Uh, I am French Canadian, I'm actually a Acadian, um, it's a particular French Canadian, and long story short, uh, my ancestors were deported from Canada in the 1700s. So this poem deals with this, just so you know. Oh, and there's lines from a children's song in French, but I'm not going to sing them. <laughs> not that brave. <laughs> the deportation orders were read in English. Women and children were hoarded onto boats. The moon was claustrophobic in the dreams of the burning houses. Il était un petit navire. The reasons were never fully understood. Uncertainty crept into their dining tables. Il était un petit navire. Some hid in the woods in pajama pants while the deported were brought to the 13 colonies. Qui n'avait jamais navigué. French was not spoken, but spat out. Sending them to France was the next best thing. Qui n'avait jamais navigué. France shunned their own spit, so the language found a new home under the houses. Thank you. Oh, it's an honor for me to be with my other job. Um, having said that, I'm just going to read poems. I wasn't sure what to read. Um, and then um, Rachel read a translation of Mother Tongue, so I just couldn't read this. I'm only going to read for five to seven minutes, so I might just stop in the middle of this end. And uh, as soon as you all know, have a copy, you can take it home and finish it. Okay. It's an English for a great Russian poet, or it's Mother Tongue. For those of you who do not know who he is, well, there is a lot of air in the library, you can go and find that. <laughs> uh, all you need to know for the purpose of this poem is that Mother Tom happened to be a great Russian poet who happened to write a poem against the government, which means that she was sent into exile where he died, and she thought not yet to survive it, and the poem is the time spoken in voice as opposed to and not yet to Mother Tom. Okay? Can you hear me okay? A little louder. Louder? A mother northeast sent to hell, he never returned. While his widow searched across one six of the earth's surface, clutching the soul's spot with his sons rolled up inside, memorizing them by night, in case they were found by furious to the search for it. While there is still some light on the page, she escapes in a stranger's court with his wife on the close mouth of sweat. A dark runs after them, licking the yard where they walk at inside. In the kitchen, on a stairwell above the toilet, he will show her the way to silence the relief the radio told him to itself. Making love, they turn off the lights, but the neighbors have been oculus, and he watches the settling on his lids. It is in the 1930s, Pittsburgh is a frozen trip, the casino's scuffles down empty prospect. The move has a new state, sticks its pins in the sand. In Crimea, he gathered it together with liberals and said to them strictly, on the judgment day, if you are arrested, whether you understood the poet Osip Mandershtam, say no. Have you found him? You must answer. Yes. I'm reading aloud the book of my life on earth and confess I love it gravely. In the kitchen sauce, just testing what can the man raise their cups. A boy in a white shirt, I give my finger and that's witness. Mother watches behind my ears and we speak of everything that has not come to. Which is to say, it was enough good stuff, good delight, and at least for a few years, good still enhanced with a language that does just like smoke. Now, memory, put some beers out the rim of the glass, you who write in me, have what you want, a golden coin, my time to put it under 
The younger brother of Claude, he walks and shaven and dark green pants. In cathedral, she falls on his knees, praying happiness. His words in a floor are just currents of dead books. I have loved, yes. Worst my hand spoke of loyalty to the earth. Now there's a lover boy counts my fingers. I escape, and I'm caught, escape again, and I'm caught, escape. And I'm caught in the sun. The singer is a cliff, you go. Poetry is a cell phone, Zeus, a cell phone, several St. Petersburg stands like a lost youth who charges chips and guillotines, accelerate our lives. In summer 1924, Osip Manderstam brought his young wife to St. Petersburg. Nadezhda, what was the French called love, my charmant? Alexander, of course he was. He threw a student down the staircase for complaining he wasn't published. Was it Shatton? Was Saffron? Was Jesus Christ? <laughs> Boy, it is a voice I say like he could not switch print to himself as he falls. Yet my life has a broken branch in a wind hit the northern ground. I'm writing now a history of snow, the lamp laid by the ship that sail across the page. But I'm certain after noon the Republic of Trump's open up and I grow frightened in that I haven't lived and died not enough to scratch this earth to the intervals. Here, splashes of clear biblical speech are in Plato, Augustine, the loneliness of their syllables while the cross keeps falling and I read Ahmad and a college weight by and smith to the earth and at least and it's you that's breathing to die here, to die life. Yes, I live it. The state had me up by the feet I saw St. Peter's bird daughter swans I learned the grammar of God's array and found myself for good down pushed in street while memory suddenly cornered, erased me. It's a sponge. I have made mistakes, yes. In bed, I compared government to my girlfriend. Hmm. Government, then I got Barbara's head shaven off the skin. All of us dancing happily around him. He sat at the edge of his chair and drummed a lot of good dinners. He composed his poems not at his desk but in the streets of St. Petersburg. He adored the image as he lost it, tearing apart the night under the walls of Acropolis with his son. Like a tap in the south, he was banging on the door. You have got to let me out. I wasn't made for prison. <coughs> Once or twice in his life, a man is spilled like apples. What is left is a voice that splits his being down to the center we see obscenity, fright, mud, but there is joy of shame. There is always more than one silence. Between here and Nefty Prospect, the ears spurred like strange, afraid for this man. Who lived on bread and tomatoes while dark street lighted his poetry in each street? Yes, count March, July, with them together with a dread at this time, Lord. Press this force against your silence. The story is told of a man who escapes and is captured into the prose of evenings. After making love, he sits up and a kitchen floor eyes wide open, speaks of the Lord, Sam Tinius, and who they watch me. I wait. He is out of work. I am not see the where I dirt his teeth and his wife's neck so the skin of her belly tightens. What would think of a boy that syllabus with his tongue and a woman's skin? Those are lines so entirely of silence. Nadjarta, his wife, looked up from the page and speaks. Osip, Ahmadova and I were standing together when suddenly Mother Tom noted with joy. Several little girls ran past us, imagining themselves to be horses. The first one stopped and passionately asked him, Where is the last horse? I gave it Mother Tom by his hand to prevent him from joining. And Ahmadova, too, sent the danger, whispered, Do not run away from us. You are our last horse. The daughter continues to speak. Have I died? 
I was very food across my country, here of winter built the throne, the sun into tractors breaking the centers and gallop the plane speech. And twenty three, we live in a cocoon, the butterflies are mating, or he puts his fingers in the fire, he gets up early, vaulting around in his sandals, right slowly, players fall in his room, master watching him from the window, as his tongue passes over my skin, I see his face from underneath, it's egg and clarity. That's my dad that speaks, standing in an orange light. Oh, I'm so quiet, talking to themselves. O oh, God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, and the scale of good and evil, put a plate of warm food. My daughter continues to speak. When my husband returned from Varonish and his mouth, he hid a silver spoon. In his dream, down of the prospect, the dictator ran like a wolf after his first a wolf is sleep in his eyes. He believed that the human being could endure himself of Petersburg. He recited my heart phone numbers of the dead. Oh, what he told in a low voice, the unspoken words became the traces of violence when he slapped it on stone in the face. It was good. But I took my husband, each for disappeared in a book. They watched him as he spoke with vowels and his And they said, you must leave me on, for already behind his back the stones circle all by themselves. And foul. Ozip had the eyelashes to the middle of his cheeks. We were walking along breath in the street. But we were talking about I don't remember. We turned and the Gogol divided, and Ozip said, I'm ready for that. At his arrest, they were searching for bombs all over the floor. We sat in one room. On the other side of the wall, at neighbors, a Hawaiian guitar was playing. In my presence, the investigator found the wolf and showed it to Austin. She nodded slightly. Taking his leave, he kissed me. He was led away at 7 a.m. At the end of each vision, Mother's time stands with a cloud of words, robbing bits of the passers by. You will recognize him, love. He hated such castle, Lord of my coffee, stop reading a verse, you're not a Romanian orchestra. <laughs> but what harmony was? It raveled and unraveled, not just the sense of snowfall and sigh, for she heard the voice of young chick and so over her flesh, not yet. Her yes and no are difficult to tell apart. She dances as her packet between her thighs and the light is trenching in and it chums for corners. He's making love to her ear, love his breath. Giving days in the nuts, he's traveling across her kitchen, touching furniture and smoke propeller and his heart turning as he speaks. Outside, a boy pissing against the tree, a beggar cursing at his cat, that summer, 1938, the wolves were hard. The sun beat against the city, slapped the city, and loved to say yes to the powerful. At the end of each vision, she rubbed her feet with milk. She opened her body, lay on his stomach. We will meet in Petersburg, he said. We have buried the sun there. Prologue. Out here, the snow is an insider. It's the old couture of my days. I invent a friend to pour out remembrances of the old country. Out here, I invent new sound, new men, new women. I assassinate the old days with nostalgia. I don't see but invent a city and its people, its fury, its sky. I don't belong to the earth but to the air. As I invent you, I invent myself. Yes. 
I would like to read this uh, poem that uh, um, I don't read very often, but uh, it seems that uh, people know a little bit of uh, my background here. Um, so I think that uh, you will be able to connect the uh, uh, events in Latin America with, uh, um, with the poem. Too. Love for the subversive. One. What do we do with the love if you die? Do we put it in your coffin together with the green, red, and gray plaid skirt you like so much? With your khaki pants and lined, light brown shoes, the ones you use in your normal life? Or do we wrap it around the flag the Patriotic Front Militia will bring to cover you? I spent nights sleepless thinking about what to do with the love if you die. Maybe we will put it in a crown of flowers, like the ones people weave for Scandinavian men when they become bridegrooms. Your mother will say no, Chileans men don't wear flowers on their head. It will be awkward. I understand her. I will try to put it in a letter that you could read when you're alone, a long time. To be honest, I don't know what to do with the love if you die. Part two. Santiago is in a scarlet puddle of idiot, poet, assassins, and innocent. You say to yourself before it happened. Part three. I remember only the scars over your lips scars over your left eyebrow, the pieces of flesh missing around your nostril. The pain of your scars wake me up at night and I hurt as I did the given birth to your child. I don't know with any certainty what to do next. One day at a time they tell me, I will wait until the answer comes with clarity from behind the smoke of the landmine or the hand grenade that took you away from my hand. I will keep secret all your names, the places where we will raise a barricade and mount attacks on police station until they kill us all or they surrender. When I drive down from Gross Point on Warren, a sudden knot in my heart is born. Solitude is roaming with the images of a city broken and gone. I cross my fingers, hoping I won't see any black cat crossing these steaming manholes. Detroit, so full of churches. So where is God? Could he be hiding under politician's coat? A monster looked through my cabin window and believe he melted snow. His eyes, a flame consumed two seconds and when the red lights stop, city in flame, who took away your palaces? It wasn't me, I'm a foreigner. I just came to see Detroit wake up from your sleep, rebuild your empire, rebuild it so I can see. Forget about black lachishas and uh, white porches. Forget about yellow chains and your brown carolas. Let the golden haze that the rust on your aura shine proudly on your face again. Let a feeling of the goodness drench the city like a storm. Let your dream flourish and endure. Turn this holy fight into salutation. Let the happiness return. Leave your vinegar grief behind. Let me see Detroit. I'm reading in the last 10 years, so I'm a very <laughs> slow writer. But uh, there is no hurry. It's better to try to do your best and then to publish a lot of books, right? <laughs> <laughs> a letter. When I got home from the hospital, there was a bed and a baby bed beside it. And a letter from my mother that was a forward from the refugee camp. In the letter my mother said 
that the, she has missed the bus and that Ola had brought her from the south of Chile to the airport to say goodbye. Somebody told her that I was leaving. She had read about Jay's death in the newspapers. More than a thousand people came to his funeral and the riot that followed were covered on national TV. Reuters smuggled pictures out of the country and in the archives of the agency that I will read 20 years later, it will said, the case of Jay's may turn into another scandal similar to the case concerning the death of the three degollados. The last paragraph of the letter said, I hope now with your mother, yourself, you can understand your own mother a little bit better. I couldn't answer her, not because I didn't have anything to say, but it was so hard to say it. I wish I could have written something to her at that time to bring us closer. But I still couldn't think clearly. It would be a long time before I could. I read to you from a book called Lend Me Your Voice. In Swedish, Wintergata, literally Milky Way. <coughs> and uh, first, uh, the introduction of the book. Imagine moments when all the experience and all the values of a human being are condensed into a sudden insight. The universe of time surrounding us might then glitter like a milky way from such epiphanies. Sometimes ecstatic, more often bitter, but always with the luster of human understanding. If you manage to catch these testimonies, how would they sound? It's a person's task to answer that question. It's a challenge I once expressed in a poem, Let Me Your Voice, which gives this book a title. The moments which could be recreated in that way form a series without an end, a history on the margin of history. <laughs> a similar catalogue was begun more than 2,000 years ago by the anonymous Greek poets who gave voice to the many dead in the work known as the Greek Anthology. And I think you all know it uh, by intermediaries such as uh, Edgar Lee Master, Bispoon River Anthology, he learned from the Greek Anthology. So did the great uh, Korean poet Kuhn. He referred to the Greek Anthology as a, as a pattern for his 10,000 lives. Let's begin in, in the oldest times. Although an ice block has saved me for your time, you can't reach me. You ask, who are you? What did you think? Who did you love? Just what I ask myself. You know only my last meal, dried goat's meat and nuts. The last thing I ate there was probably snow. Beaten by the storm, fingers and feet numb, all I remember happening was a woman stooping over me while I was <coughs> crouched on the path. A stranger I thought I'd always known. I fumbled right through her. Her face was burning, out of reach. She stayed with me while the world shrank to an ice block. Then in Mesopotamic, Mesopotamic time, the air smells of approaching thunder. I was still in the age of wars. Our new heads being spiked up on stakes in the rubbish dumps beyond the city gate. I know only this moment. Pressed together like two dragonflies, we soar out across the Euphrates, Euphrates buzzing, filled by something resembling sunlight.
might remember the uh, Greek poet Tyrtaeus, who wrote the poem, This is glorious when bravely you fall to the fore, the first heroic poem. Death was said to be glorious when bravely you fall to the fore. To the man already on his knees, there was nothing glorious in the slash <coughs> from behind on the shoulder blade or the stab in the crotch. Nothing glorious either in the women who came by night and snatched from me the fumbled picture of the woman and never stopped loving, but searched in vain down here without the picture of the same memory. Have I been straying for one year or a thousand? One thing I do know. I'm tireless in my search for whoever wrote about that glorious death. I've saved this little knife, a rarity down here, to slit the tongue out of his mouth. <laughs> now we're in the Middle Ages. <laughs> It must have been a hall with a window at each end, each giving on nothing. A swallow flickered in through the one, swirled about dazzled by light, and vanished through the other. I can see that <coughs> was my life, but not who I was. Perhaps a Saxon chieftain, struck by the sudden brightness into believing it was God he had met, and now perforce must christen his people. Or perhaps an Arabian poet, presented with his life's work in a moment suffused with light between nothing and nothing. I was called Maria. I was made of wood, a wooden sorrow, long drawn out wooden thoughts, a worn out wooden womb. But my room <coughs> shone with lapis lazuli and was bespangled with pinpoint stars. Once I was cajoled into smiling by a jester who wanted to honor the mother of God with his meager skills. He did somersaults, sang in falsetto, mimic all of nature's creatures, it was so pathetic even wood could feel touched. I stepped down from my plinth, my robe billowing aurora, and held the startled fellow's head in my hands. Dazed by his smells, I fumbled in his matted hair, stooped, creaking, kissed his sweaty forehead. But that an unknown pain stabbed me. I was, for a moment, human. I fled up on my plinth, leaving the jester shaken by what he took to be a miracle. But the real amazement real miracle of humanity, that was mine. <coughs> now it's the uh, time of the French Revolution. <laughs> In the minutes before they fetched me, I stood by the window, far in the glass. The rattle of the prisoner's cart on the cobbles, the booze and gobbets of the mob, the drums surrounding the guillotine, none of these yet existed. Calmly, I took leave of the voices in the street through the reflection of my pocket face. Nor did it pass it by. At my walls who smiled back without suspecting I would that day be called a traitor. <coughs> had her lean on the window frame, taking leave too of the revolution, sown to be sold to the highest bidder. I gazed wistfully at the cloud. It carried my dream beyond the reach of those who booted their way up my stairs.
And in earlier years, when I'd been heavily thrashed, I took my way down to the river to let my gaze follow its flow and teach myself indifference. But this evening, the Volga bore a film of sunlight with a golden mold and tin in a crucible. Lord, how can you let a tremendous surf witness a beauty that gives such pain? I was at the far end of the gallery when the roof caved in, so I was spared for some four days. I was 13 and new to the mine, now in water to the knees. The dark was so thick it felt rough, distant voices fainter and fainter, like some kind of old-fashioned English. Water streamed from the roof, the rats splashed in panic. The only direction was in the rail I felt with my feet. It ended in the rubble. I thought at last that someone came, the poorest of the poor, and that the water sounded like a brook in spring. And then a poem from my childhood landscape in the north of Sweden. It's a true story. The farmer disappeared on the ice. No one knew what would happen. Driving my load across the ice, I heard the ice crack. <coughs> a flow slanted sliding me to the water. The load went down, the horse went up, kicking at the air to pull us up among the clouds. Then the green lid of ice shut over us. The questions swarmed round me. All those worries I pestered the priest with, the tattered books Marjorie scribbled with my anxieties. They never found us. But in the rising bubbles I saw clearly what life had wanted of me. Hmm. Um, you remember in Hiroshima there was a shadow on the wall of a woman so the only left of the woman is this black shadow on the wall. As if the sun had been let loose over Hiroshima and turned me into this shadow in the wall. I remember nothing. Whoever lives in the surface has no past. Therefore, my thoughts run in circles between the blackness in the brick, which is me, and the sky in the wall, which is sun. If this circling could only reach a finger breadth out, thought would climb as in a spiral stair, look down and think it understood. I dream now and then about space and waking in vertigo. I think I'm a woman on the way to meet someone, stopped among very clear shadows of grass. No one can take the other in the hand, since nothing can be raised from the surface. No one can slide onto the other in a shadow of lust. But we nudge each other and freeze. There are no clouds here, no birds. It's autumn or spring. Rain belongs to what can't be thought. There are doors, but no rooms. There are voices, but no echoes. Everything is abbreviated as if history had taken a shortcut through